skull that, with the red skull on it that came up in the middle of Ebbets Field and wrecked it. I know you were a Dodgers fan. <laughs> yes, I was. Uh, I was a... Uh, um, oh, I wasn't a rabbit baseball fan, but I, I went to the games often with friends. And uh, I love the Dodgers because, uh, well, they're, they're, they'll always be a colorful team for me. It, it's a personal thing, of course. Uh, as for the Red Skull, uh, I was growing up. It was a period when I was growing up, and I finally asked myself, why am I making this Red Skull so evil? Uh, why is he such a bad guy? And I felt there was a story behind that, behind the Red Skull. And I began to think of him as a person. Mm -hmm. And remember, in my early years, he was merely just a villain. You had no origin at first. You gave him characterization, uh, deeper characterization in the 60s. Well, I gave him deeper characterizations because, well, I, I was growing up and questioning myself. Yes. And uh, remember, uh, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a child of my own times. Yes. I was questioning my own times. One, one of the, just as a footnote, one of the... Um, uh, objects, one of the grails, you might say, in Captain America and the Red Skull uh, during the 60s, was an object called the Cosmic Cube. And I'm sure you must uh, be aware, uh, hopefully with some pride, that now in the field of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, parallel computer processing and new approaches to computing, that one of the new computing devices that uh, is based on massive parallel structure is called the Cosmic Cube. Well, uh, uh, I mean, it, it flatters me for you to make the connection, but uh, however, I'm, I'm sure it's a, it's a technical term today, whereas yesterday, as far as, uh, you know, where storytelling is concerned, uh, it was, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, a wonderful keystone for uh, many, many good stories. So I use the Cosmic Cube as I, I would use any other gimmick uh, on which to base five or six stories, or maybe more. The Cosmic Cube, to me, uh, was certainly a part of the mystery uh, which we're still trying to solve. What is there out in space? Uh, uh, and, and the many other questions that come with it. Are we the only form of life? If there is life out there, what, what kind of life will we find? And the Cosmic Cube is that clue is that little clue maybe left behind in the human mind. Somewhere in the human mind, that question is important. And it was important to me because, well, uh, I was doing that sort of thing. So it became important to me. And therefore, I created the Cosmic Cube. Uh, probably, uh, uh, it was material from the same fountainhead from which I was asking questions. Speaking of cosmic parallel of pipeheads, this is Earthwatch on WBAI in New York. My name is Robert Knight, here with Warren Reese, celebrating the 70th birthday of Jack Kirby, live on this air. Also with us in the studio is the producer of the Golden Age of Radio here, Max Schmied. Hi, Jack. Uh, hello. Uh, I've been sitting in on this conversation, and uh, one or two questions have occurred to me. Uh, we're discussing now the war years of the of the 40s, and yeah. you've been saying that you write uh, very often to explore your own feelings and thoughts about things, but what market did you feel you were writing for? We consider today, or uh, the general thought is, that comic books are for children. Was that uh, the thought at the time? Did you feel you were writing basically for a children's audience? Oh, that was not true at all. I was writing for everybody. I was exploring everybody. I wanted to know about everybody, and I'm still doing that today. I, I, as I said before, people were always important to me. I wanted to know more about them. And in, in creating those stories, uh, I was exploring people, and I was exploring the questions uh, that people ask. I was exploring my own self and reality, uh, and I'm still doing that today. 
Yeah, I've got some follow-ups on that in a minute, specifically about your years doing the science fiction stories about the aliens. But I just had a couple more quickies about your work on Cap. When you did uh, the covers of Captain America number seven and Young Allies number one, I have line art from house ads that show that they were redone. The changes that were made on the cover of the Young Allies made sense. The Allies characters were made larger, and Joe Stalin was omitted from the cover presumably because the non-aggression pact with Hitler fell through and uh, he became one of the allies. But on the cover of Captain America number 7, which prominently featured the Red Skull on the inside, uh, the figure of the Red Skull cutting a spiked ball down over Betty Ross was changed on the cover to look like an ordinary Nazi. That's always been a mystery to me, and I was wondering if you could clarify anything about that, Jack. Well, uh, I... I I can't recall the, um, uh, uh, you know, that particular issue. My, you know, I can't recall it uh, well uh, today. I, uh, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I'd have to take more time than you give me to, uh, uh, to define it. However, I can, I can tell you that uh, uh, whatever I drew there uh, made sense to me at the time, and uh, uh, they were, they reflected the times, and what uh, I. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't recall the particular story. However, uh, uh, if I drew Betsy Ross uh, uh, doing that, it was, it was uh, an essential part of that story and, and something to uh, keep the reader interested. And uh, never meant, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it never meant anything more than that. Now let's just flip up there. I noticed the early caps uh, from 1941 and 42 smacked of your influences of film. The characters and the stories seem to be involved often with movie making or using projection techniques. But I also noted that some of the costuming, I, for example, in one story that you did with Ivan the Terrible, very authentically Russian. Were you influenced by any of Sergei Eisenstein's films like uh, Alexander Nevsky? Uh, how, and just the overall use of... Um, film-type characters in Captain America, the Phantom Hound of Cardiff Moore, which was like uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, the Hunchback of Hollywood, uh, all these things. Well, I can tell you that you've said it all for me. Uh, I'm a movie... Uh, uh, I, I always was and uh, uh, I always will be a, a, a movie goer. Uh, essentially, uh, what I've always done uh, was, a, was a kind of a still movie. And... Uh, and it was the reason I, I, I dropped editorial cartoons uh, to do comic strips, because comic strips gave me more uh, room to do a movie. And when the comic strips became limited, I did comic books because they gave me more room to do a movie. And I suppose I, uh, I'm, I'm probably the type that will probably work on an endless movie. Uh, <laughs> which I'll never finish, I suppose. But essentially, that's what I've always tried to do. i tried to, uh, uh, for my very early years, uh, I've been an inveterate moviegoer, and still am, and uh, I, I love the media. So what I, what I draw and uh, what I'm still doing uh, is, is part of that... Um, uh, particular orientation. Uh -huh. Also in that time, in Captain America number 7, you had a villain who was called the Toad in the story, wore a bat-like costume, but I caught something on the contents page, Jack, and he was called the Bat there. Was anybody worrying about troubles with the Batman people at the time? Uh, everybody was always worrying about something, I can tell you. <laughs> and uh, uh, I... Uh, I, I never try to uh, uh, get too close or, uh, uh, you know, get too, too close to uh, anybody's costume. Uh -huh. However, I, I tried to do the kind of character that was being done at the time. Uh, remember, uh, at that time, uh, uh, everybody was thinking alike. Superheroes uh, resembled each other in one way or another. Yeah. However, uh, we did our best to... Uh, 
uh, make them as different as possible. Up to the foundations of the 60s, around 1959, you started doing a lot of these wonderful stories about monsters, uh, which I found coincided with the release of a lot of the classics on uh, Channel 9 here in New York, King Kong, Son of Kong, Godzilla. And then you got into these, uh, some of my favorite things were about these aliens, for example, the electronic giant, the blip, who was really a benevolent uh, alien uh, enraged by human savagery. Please comment, Jack, on your use of the monster. And, and of course, the monster is the uh, either the benevolent being or else the misunderstood monster, which is the foundation of the Hulk and the thing and characters with which the public is all the more familiar today. Well, I don't think that monsters are, uh, are ever mysterious. Uh, monsters in human or in human form are uh, are are living uh, are living things with uh, problems uh, which uh, vex them sorely in in some way, and therefore uh, they're in, they're inevitably involved in some sort of conflict which uh, in, in which anybody can get hurt. Uh, I don't think monsters zero in on anyone in particular, uh, and uh, I I think that's why they are generally pitied more than feared. And uh, I felt the same way about them. Uh, I felt that monsters in some way had problems. Yes. Let's get right into the Marvel days now uh, and the Fantastic Four. The powers of the Fantastic Four, with which everyone is already familiar, seem to be reflections of the personalities of each of them. Would this be some manifestation of how the mind that held them together during cosmic accident that should have disintegrated them uh, subconsciously guided the instability of their cells, their molecules, to produce this, this monster that was the gruff Ben Grimm? this totally flexible man who had the totally flexible mind, this hot-headed teenager who literally becomes, a, you know, a, a hothead, and in, in the pre-women's lib days, the defensive female who had uh, the invisibility to hide and then later the invisible barrier. Were these manifestations of the personalities, Jack? Well, uh, I, I think they were manifestations of my own, and uh, they were manifestations of the times. Uh, remember, these were uh, we were absorbed with uh, the the possible uh, and catastrophic results of radiation. Remember, we didn't know what how radiation would uh, would affect anybody, and uh, and being involved in the sale of comics, uh, I used it uh, I used it in that manner uh, to sell comic books, and uh, I used it in, uh, in as entertaining way as possible. Uh, Psychologically, uh, whatever the characters, whatever characters emerged, uh, or were possibly uh, uh, the way I, I personally would imagine them. Yeah, uh, like, well, for example, a Doctor Doom would seem to show how. Uh, evil and indeed even nobility could come out of the mistreatment of a human being uh, or the Hulk the, who was the misunderstood monster. Maybe you could talk with us just for a couple of minutes about the the genesis of uh, the Hulk of Dr. Doom of a few of your uh, you know uh, Gee, everything by you seems like a major creation to me, but uh, you know what I mean. Just talk about There what are Dr. Dooms and, do and Hulks and all of us and uh, if you read if you read every one of your news stories uh if you read any any dramatic news story you'll find uh, there were human beings involved and uh, you you can and and you, you know as well as anybody else uh that uh, uh there there have been some pretty weird news stories at our times and yet human beings are involved in them and when you uh and when you dissect the stories themselves, uh, uh, you'll find uh, that they're not really dramatic at all. That the most dramatic part about them was that inside the human being, uh, uh, there are some sort of problems that uh, uh, we're constantly trying to solve. And I felt that uh, my villains, as well as my heroes, were human beings and therefore could have very bad problems. I had a villain called Dr. Doom, and Dr. Doom had a, uh, he had a severe problem. He was a perfectionist, and perfectionists never solve their problems. 
Uh, it's a belief of my own that uh, none of us can be perfect. And if you're a perfectionist, uh, you've got an inner conflict which can never be solved. This is Earthwatch on WBAI. I'm Robert Knight, here in the studio with Warren Reese and with Jack Kirby, live on the phone, celebrating his 70th birthday. And now comes the question about one of my favorite Marvel comics, Spider-Man, uh, who, uh, it, it, who was not exactly neurotic, but had enough problems to have justifiably been so. How in the world did uh, Spider-Man come into being? Well, uh, uh, if you had been in Spider-Man, <laughs> if you, uh, Spider-Man was also a creature of radiation, and uh, another version of, uh, of of that type of situation, creating a hero instead of a villain, and so Spider-Man became a hero, and uh, he dealt he dealt with his own conflict in a, in a very heroic manner, and he still does today. Uh, I think Spider-Man is a, is a lesson for all of us, that no matter what our problem is, uh, it's our problem. And uh, if we make a heroic effort, we could possibly, uh, may, we possibly may not solve it, but we can live with it. And Spider-Man lives with his problem. A quick follow-up on that. Uh, Jack, uh, you were involved, I know, creatively at the genesis of Spider-Man. Yeah. And then legend has it that you, of course, making everything look so much bigger and better and more wonderful than life, Stan wanted him to look like the guy in the street. And therefore, Steve Ditko did the interiors, but I know you they used some of your covers. Uh, maybe you could clarify for us, uh, uh, though I know how modest you are, try to solve for us without hurting anybody, some of the mystery of your involvement at that time in the genesis of Spider-Man at Amazing Fantasy 15. And uh, then, uh, of course, it departed and went uh, another way. But you were there at the beginning. Please tell us about it, Jack. Well, I can tell you that I was deeply involved with creating Spider-Man. And uh, I can't go any further than that, really, uh, uh, because uh, there have been so many variations uh, uh, and uh, different things done with Spider-Man. But uh, I can tell you at the beginning, I was deeply involved with him. Well, let's uh, turn then to the environment, which may be equally as important, the environment out of which Spider-Man was created. And, of course, you were involved in the historic partnership with Stan Lee at, at Marvel. And uh, so uh, what was the working environment like there? How was it different from uh, the other companies? Uh, what was the Merry Marvel Marching Society like? Well, it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't, well, I didn't consider it merry. I considered it very, uh, uh, well, in those days, it was a, it was a professional type thing. Uh, uh, you turned in your, your ideas and, uh, and uh, you, uh, you got your wages and, uh, and you took them home. It, it, it was a very, very simple affair. Uh, I, it's nothing that could be dramatized or glorified or... Uh, glamorized in any way. Uh, it was a very, very simple affair. Uh, I, uh, I, I created the situation, uh, uh, and uh, I panelized them. I did them panel by panel, and I did everything but uh, put the words in the balloons. But all of it was mine except the words in the balloons. But, uh, Jack, what about these legendary story conferences of, of you and Stan, or Stan and whomever, acting the stories out in the office, jumping up on the desks and so forth, making things considerably more lively than when it was just an office consisting of Stan and fabulous Flo Steinberg uh, having people stick their faces in the door from magazine management going, hurry up, little elves, Santa will be coming soon. Uh, I'd have to disagree with that. Uh, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, it may have been like that after I shut the door and went home. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to open a door, a very special surprise door, Jack. And uh, let me mention, this is Earthwatch on WBAI in New York. I'm Robert Knight, here with Warren Reese, also with Max Schmid in the studio. We're speaking with Jack Kirby live. And now we can announce the very special surprise guest that we have for tonight's program, your uh, colleague or uh, in arms, Stan Lee. Good morning, Stan. Are you? Hey, how you doing? Okay. 
say. Um, I just, uh, I want to wish Jack a happy birthday. This is a hell of a coincidence. I'm in New York, and I was tuning in the radio, and there I hear him talking about Marvel, and I figured, well, I might as well call and not <laughs> let this occasion go by without saying many happy returns, Jack. Well, Stanley, uh, I want to thank you for calling, and uh, uh, I hope you're in good health, and uh, I hope you stay in good health. I'm doing my best, and the same to you. You know, you were talking earlier about um, your drawing, and people sometimes criticized your figures and so forth. I, uh, I always felt that the most important thing about your drawings, I remember when I was a kid and I first saw Captain America, it wasn't the correctness of the anatomy but it was the emotion that you put in to me nobody could convey emotion and drama the way you could i didn't care if the drawing was all out of whack because that wasn't important you got your point across and nobody could ever draw a hero like you could and i just want to say without getting too saccharine that one of the marks i think of a really true great artist is he has his own style and you certainly had and still have your own style, and it's a style that nobody has even been able to come close to. And I think that's something you can be very proud of, and uh, and I'm proud of you for it. I have to thank you for uh, helping me to keep that style, Stanley, and uh, uh, helping me to uh, evolve all that. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm certain that uh, whatever we did together, we... Uh, we got sales for Marvel, and I... I think it was more than that, Jack. We certainly got the sales, but whatever we did together, and no matter who did what, and I guess that's something that'll be argued forever, but I think that the product that was produced was really even more than a sum of its parts. I think there was some slight magic that came into effect when we worked together, and um, I, I am re very happy that we've had that experience. Well, uh, I was never sorry for it, Stanley. Uh, it was a great experience for me. And uh, certainly, uh, if the product was good, that was my satisfaction. And uh, I've, I've always felt like that. And uh, I, I think uh, it's the feeling of every good professional. And uh, uh, it, it's one of the reasons I respect you is the fact that you know, you're certainly a, a good professional, and uh, uh, and you're certainly fond of a good product, and I feel that's the that's the mark of all of us. You notice I never interrupt you when you're saying something nice about me. <laughs> let, let me uh, say something nice about Stan Lee. Uh, the uh, editorial uh, uh, piston behind the motor of Marvel Comics, and of course Stan Lee has been active in so many other areas. Stan, what are some of the things that you are proudest of, and what are you involved in now? Well, actually, I guess I'm proud of just about it. I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I'm proud of everything that has succeeded, and I've totally forgotten anything that might have failed. Uh, right now, I'm uh, New World Pictures has bought Marvel Comics, and they're really a great outfit. They're, obviously, they do motion pictures. In fact, they changed their name recently to New World Entertainment. They do television series, video cassettes, and I've gotten involved in all of those aspects of the business, as well as their animation studio, so I'm only really peripherally involved in the comics, and I've never been happier because I, I guess I like being busy, and I've never been busier. And out of the uh, fairness doctrine, uh, what, Jack, are you currently doing? I'm, I'm probably involved in the same sort of thing. Oh, my God. That means that the two of you who uh, indelibly changed the history of comics when you are, were both in that field uh, have a shot at changing uh, the, the course of animation, perhaps. Well, uh, I feel that productive people are always doing something productive. And uh, speaking for myself, uh, I've never stopped. Well, let me now uh, desaccharinize the conversation and let's get down to uh, both of your assessments of the state of comics today. I mean, it, uh, enough can never be said about what you have done in the history of comics, but I'd like uh, f f for some specific comments and naming of names in regard to the changes that have, that have taken place in um, comics, such with the new, the, the, new, um, uh, the new approach to Batman, for instance, um, the... Um, uh, 
the current Spider-Man series, the uh, introduction of ambiguity, conflict, and contradiction in um, issues and ethics today. Uh, what do you have any uh, views on that? What do you want first? Uh, you, since you spoke first. Okay. Well, actually, I think that we had plenty of conflict, and. Uh, when we were starting uh, our early strips, certainly there was conflict in the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and all of them. Um, and we had, I, I think, really Marvel sort of pioneered playing up the characterization more and playing up the personal problems of the heroes, making the heroes more believable because they were more realistic and more human. However, today what has happened, and it's a natural evolution, today they've gone many steps beyond what we started doing in those days. I think the stories primarily are much more complex, they're more adult, they tackle subjects that we couldn't dream of tackling in the in the early days. And um, I, I think we were, it's strange, when Marvel started, our stories were very much like the motion pictures of those days. Today, the comics, especially I think Marvel comics, are very much like the motion pictures of today. Well, the motion pictures of today are so much different than they were then, and the same change, the same involvement has really taken place in comic books. Well, I, I, I think Stanley is uh, correct on that, and uh, uh, of course the standards have changed, and uh, the standards have changed in all, all the fields. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll agree with uh, I'll I'll agree with uh, what Stanley uh, says of uh, all the facets of entertainment because uh, he understands it and uh, he understands it as well as I do. Uh, whatever is evolving, uh, I couldn't put my finger on it, but it's certainly different from uh, the black and white uh, type of thing that we we did. Uh, and what you refer to as the golden age. Are there things that you look at uh, with interest these days? Oh, sure. Now, there's a DC series called The Watchmen, which I think was absolutely superb. There's the work that John Byrne has been doing, the work that Frank Miller has been doing. Um, th there are so many new artists coming up that are they are very sophisticated, and they're very dramatic, and they're very cinematic. A lot of them write and draw. They have their own styles. And uh, my, my big regret, really, is I don't have time to read the books the way I used to. Yeah, but the uh, younger people have absorbed a lot more than we did, Stan. They have what? I think that that's what that's what it's all about today. I'm I think sorry, I didn't hear that, Jack. Understanding of life, and uh, they're a lot more understanding of themselves. And what they produce, what they produce is on a very realistic scale. And uh, I don't think there is uh, any, anything... Uh, visually around us uh, that the younger people haven't noticed. Uh, well, that's why I respect the younger people. You know, it's much more a visual uh, era that we live in now than it was when we were starting because with television today, I mean, you know, as a matter of fact, I don't know if anybody has brought this up, but comics are like the last bastion, the last defense against creeping illiteracy, if not for comics. I don't know how many young people there would be who just wouldn't ever read um, because they're just hooked on television, which is understandable. But luckily, they do get hooked on comics and they do learn to equate reading with pleasure. And after a while, when they get the reading habit, they go on to, to reading other books as, as kids are wont to do. But I think uh, that, which most people don't think of, but I think that's a very important function that comics are serving today. Stan Lee and Jer Jack Kirby here on Earthwatch. My name is Robert Knight. Also with me is Warren Reese, who has some words for you. But I can't resist um, just some very quick um, word associations, or I guess I should say title associations. First, Dark Knight. Dark Knight, uh, I understand, is Batman. <laughs> well, that's uh, bringing Batman into the 20th century, I guess. <laughs> Or an attempt to do so, and it was it was revolutionary, and it was very successful. It, it's still Batman, and uh, it's bat it it it's Batman of today. I always used to wish. Uh, I don't think I ever told this to Jack. Uh, years ago, I always used to wish that he and I could do Batman 
Superman and Wonder Woman. I always thought that we could really inject new life into those characters. I'd say they would be highly individualistic and very entertaining. Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, current Spider-Man. The current Spider-Man? Mm-hmm. Oh, the, the current Spider-Man would be very current. It would be understandably to uh, uh, the people today. It would be... Uh, it, it, would, it would have the same essence as, uh, uh, as any other uh, character figure produced in these times. It would have to be timely. Uh, you can't produce uh, superheroes uh, in the old fashion. You've got to produce it so it can be understood uh, in, in the surroundings that we have about us today. The Nam. Great book. Great idea. I never would have thought that it would be okay that anybody would say, let's do a comic book about it. I think Marvel deserves a lot of credit for going ahead with it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I uh, am a producer of a series here called Contragate, which is an investigative report into the Iran-Contra affair, uh, which... Series on radio or television or what? It's on radio, every day, 8 o'clock a.m. on WBAI in New York, and soon to be heard nationally. Now, the um, that prompts the next association uh, in which in a title in which the plot involves CIA involvement in uh, facilitating the importation of drugs for money for arms for the Contras explicitly. That uh, occurs in uh, Mike Grill's uh, current uh, Green Arrow series. Any reactions to that? Well, I, I guess Grell is like everybody else. He stays up with the news. I, unfortunately, I haven't seen the series. But, you know, today, just as Jack and I did years ago, you try to you try to keep your stories contemporary, and if something is happening that you're involved in or you think the public is involved in, it's very hard to keep a, a smattering of that out of what you're writing. All right. Warren Reese is also here with us. Thank you, uh, Robert. First of all, to both of you gents, I have regards from fabulous Flo Steinberg, who was too shy to be in the studio today. She lives about 10 blocks from here, but sends happy birthday wishes to you, Jack, and love to both of you. Oh, that's terrific, and the same to her. <laughs> fabulous Flo thought it was me uh, Mary when we were working there. <laughs> yes, she did. Now, I... Um, both of you before were talking a bit about the, um, I think, the responsibility of creators as they create. There is much controversy going on these days over uh, company-imposed rating systems, which do not say that people cannot have explicit sex and violence, but simply have to have a warning on the cover. And these people seem to be very alarmed, as though nobody in history ever produced a good story without having that type of material in there, and I submit that they need only look back to what you wonderful gentlemen did together, to what Bill Everett did on the Submariner, or indeed what some other people of contemporary times are doing. I would like your comments on that. I would also like to put to you gentlemen that what made your work so tremendous, you know, I really, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't matter whether or not uh, you know, who exactly did what, although it would be interesting to know whether or not Galactus's exit speech in FF number 50 was an example of Jack's dialogue or stands. But you well, I'll say this. Every word of dialogue in those scripts was mine. <laughs> I don't want to... story. And I don't want to get into controversy about that. What I want to stress to you and to anyone who would be hearing this is that you two gents together, when you said the whole equals more than the sum of its parts, it is very true. I think that that was the success behind the Beatles, behind the Birds, behind many of the, the rock groups. There seems to be... I can tell you that I wrote a few lines myself above every... I yes, I've seen those. They weren't printed in the book. All right, look, both of you, hey, kids, both Listen, of you guys. Jack, Jack isn't wrong by his own lights, because, Jack, answer me truthfully. I wasn't allowed to write. Did you ever read one of the stories after it was finished? I don't think you did. I don't think you ever read one of my stories. I think you were always busy drawing the next one. You never read the book when it was finished. Dialogue, Stanley. Huh? Let me get in there with him. Press it in my own dialogue. <laughs> and, uh... That, I think that's the way people are. So uh, whatever was written in them uh, was, well, it, 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 you know, 
Uh, it was the action I was interested in. I know, and I really think, and look, Jack, nobody has more respect for you than I do, and you know that, but I don't think you ever felt that the dialogue was that important. And I think you felt, well, it doesn't matter. Anybody can put the dialogue in. It's what I'm drawing that matters. And maybe you're right. I don't agree with it, but maybe you're right. No, I, I'm, I'm only trying to say is that I, you know, I, uh, I think that uh, the human being is very important. If one man is, is writing and drawing and, and uh, doing a strip, uh, it, it should come from an individual. I believe that you should have the opportunity uh, to do the entire thing yourself. Gentlemen, what we're seeing here is, mean, par your is, own story. is part of the inner dynamics, from the, the, the bit of conflict from which obviously you complemented one another, held one another in check, and a great product emerged. I submit not only uh, on behalf of you, but to creators of today, that the success of Marvel and the, the success of Bill Everett Submariner and the success of almost anything that was really great had to do with the attention to science, to characterization, to detail, to verisimilitude, to keeping a greater attention to the characters than to the egos of the people creating them and, you know, signing autographs at conventions. And that that pretense, trying to make the thing seem as real as possible, having characters grow, having characters die, having Reed and Sue get married and have a child, whom by the way should be adult by now and dating one of the ex-women, would not only is not only showing the attention to the detail of the characters, but is an insurance that readers will not outgrow the comics and will stay with them, because it is not an immutable fact of life that you outgrow comics at 13. You know, when you mention, when you mention an ego problem, the funny thing is, I'm afraid those problems are only cropping up now. I think when Jack and I did the strips, uh, there was no ego problem. We were just doing the best we could at the time. Well, ego is the fuel of creativity, and uh, I'm very proud to have been able to have both Jack Kirby and Stan Lee live on Earthwatch on WBAI New York. My name is Robert Knight, joined by Warren Reese and Max Schmied. And as we close this program, I would like each of you to make a concluding statement. And uh, first you, Stan, and then you, Jack, because it's your birthday. Okay, well, since it is Jack's birthday, I want to make... Uh, I wish I had had time to prepare something. I didn't. But I just want to say that Jack has, I think, made a tremendous mark on American culture, if not on world culture. And I think he should be incredibly proud and pleased with himself. And uh, I want to wish him all the best, him and his wife, Roz, and his family. And I hope that 10 years from now, I'll be in some town somewhere listening to a tribute to his 80th birthday. And I hope I'll have an opportunity to call at that time and wish him well then too. Jack, I love you. Well, the same here, Stan. But, uh... Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Stan. But, uh, Warren, are you there? Yes, we're yes, all here. Yes, I am, Jack. And yeah, listen, uh, uh, you can understand now uh, how things really were. And, of course, I, uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me on your show. And uh, I can thank Robert and Max for that. Thank everybody for uh, uh, <laughs> for their courtesy, and uh, it was it was very pleasant to talk to you. Well, well I, I must uh, inject this one point of disagreement with you, Jack Kirby, and that is, it is we who have you to thank, you and Stan. Amen for that. Happy birthday, Jack, and, and thank, thank you, guys. Stan. Uh, you're really great, and uh, uh, if I said any more, it would be... Uh, You'd be looking at left field and the surprise... Uh, uh, the, sur uh, the right field, excuse me, and the surprises come from left field. Oh, listen, you guys are wonderful. <laughs> All right.